Hi, everybody, and welcome to lecture nine of the Reliable and Interpretable Artificial Intelligence course taught at ETH Zurich. My name is Martin Vechev, and I'm a professor at ETH. And in this lecture nine, we are going to be studying techniques for uh, certifying robustness to geometric transformations of uh, neural networks, okay? So if you recall so far, what we studied are techniques for certifying uh, robustness of uh, input changes, right? And uh, mostly we stuck ourselves, we focused on um, L-infinity norms, uh, LP norms in general. And now what we're going to see is how to leverage uh, some of these techniques and how to uh, apply them to certifying uh, more uh, semantic level uh, changes. Okay. So uh, let's start. Right, as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing beyond the uh, LP, uh, L-infinity, L2, and so on, uh, robustness certification, and right? And uh, so this will allow us to see how to actually use these techniques in a broader uh, context, okay? So some of the limitations that are associated with uh, a lot of this, uh, models, threat models based on LP perturbations are, first of all, you know, these LP norms, uh, specifically L infinity norm, but also the others, are in general less likely to occur in real world scenarios, right? The way that we are inserting noise in the input, in the input image, is uh, less likely to be to be happening in, a, happening in, the, in the real world. Still, it's a very good way, a very good, um, specification for pushing the methods, the certification methods, the adversarial attack methods and comparing different tools and allows making a lot of progress. But as far as real world application, it has, uh, you know, it's more limited than some of these, uh, some of these perturbations we're going to look at uh, today. But still, you know, the techniques developed in that context are very, very useful uh, in practice. Okay. Um, there are many transformations, right? Uh, beyond just uh, inserting noise in the input, which actually preserve the semantic meaning, right? Of the input. And so if you take a picture, you can uh, make some uh, transformations to the picture, which cannot be captured easily with uh, small LP balls, small L infinity balls, for instance, right? And uh, the kind of perturbations that we're going to be looking at today, the kind of transformations, are an example of some of these semantic uh, semantic changes to the, to the input. Okay. So uh, here's an example from uh, um, a recent paper. And we actually looked at uh, geometric adversarial examples earlier in the course, right at the beginning when we started, right? So on the left side here, we have uh, a picture of a revolver, right? And uh, when you actually rotate this uh, image, right, by some angle, as you see on the right uh, or in the middle here, the neural network uh, classifies this uh, rotated image as a mouse trap, right? It's no longer a revolver, which is uh, a bit unfortunate, okay? Uh, and so this kind of Semantic uh, translations or semantic changes uh, to the to the input are quite interesting, and uh, would like to be able to um, you know certify the network, certify the model that is robust against these uh, changes. Okay, so this is just an example of rotation, but there are many other geometric transformations, uh, scaling and uh, um, translation, and many more. And uh, of course, combinations of this, all right? Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on in this lecture. And uh, in this work that I listed here below, exploring the landscape of spatial robustness, you can actually see examples of various such, uh, such uh, adversarial examples, geometric adversarial examples. Okay, so let's uh, see what uh, we're going to do here. There's going to be multiple ingredients to this um, to this lecture. First, we are going to discuss a little bit how to represent geometric transformations mathematically. Right? What are the mathematical ingredients? After we see that, we're going to see how to actually 
compute an over approximation, if you like, of the effect of this uh, geometric transformation. So let's start here and let's use our uh, let's use our um, patients here that we use. Um, so what we have here is we have uh, a function, a bijective function, t kappa, so it's pronounced pronounced as kappa, which transforms coordinates. So it transforms one coordinate right into another coordinate here. And so we're going to be looking at uh, geometric transformations, which are captured by these bijective functions. Okay, and there are many such examples of geometric transformations that are captured in this way. So for example, rotations, rotation by an angle. So the kappa here is phi, right? Uh, okay, which takes this coordinate x, y here and produces a new, new coordinate here, over here, all right? And so, um, right, so the image gets, uh, gets updated, okay? Um, so that you can apply this to every coordinate, um, right? So another example of a geometric uh, transformation um, is translation. So just translating each coordinate here by some, uh, you know, in each direction, de delta x, delta y. So here we can, we can uh, add this to the coordinates, obtaining another image over here. And similarly for scaling, okay? So there are many such transformations that we capture, captured in this way. We're going to be generally looking at uh, transformations which are expressed using these uh, bijective functions. Now, um, that's one part of the story. Another part of the story is uh, the fact that when you are um, <clears throat> actually performing the transformation, you could you could have the reason, uh, you can have the, the need to reason about um, coordinates which are non-integer coordinates. And because of that, you need to account for that and uh, you need to worry about some form of interpolation, okay? So let's look at this a little bit. Um, so one ingredient is this T kappa that captures the transformation. And another ingredient is going to be interpolation, okay? And there are many different kinds of interpolations. Um, so let me just uh, get our highlighter here. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, the methods that we are presenting are general. They can be applied with uh, any interpolation, but here I'm showing you a bilinear interpolation. So the purpose of this interpolation is to compute um, the values that a pixel can take, the value a pixel can take, when uh, the coordinates uh, of the pixels are uh, non-integers, of these pixels are not integers. Okay, so, um, you know, if we have uh, a pixel value here at the non-integer coordinate, so some non-integer coordinate here, x, y, right? And this coordinates here in the box, x, y, one, two, x, one, y, two, x, y, two, x, one, y, one, and so on are all integers, okay? Then in order to compute the value at this, black dot over here for this coordinate, this x, y non-integer coordinate, we perform interpolation, okay? And there are many interpolations. There is uh, nearest neighbor interpolation, there is bicubic interpolation, there is bilinear. Here we're going to be looking at bilinear just to, um, just, to, um, just to remind you what this is. Really the geometric transformations on the previous slide or the interpolation here are completely standard. Uh, material in computer graphics and computer vision, but we need this in order to be able to explain uh, the certification later, okay? And uh, so what we have in this bilinear interpolation, right? So it takes the uh, coordinate that we care about, which, uh, you know, in this space R2, and produces the value for that coordinate, the pixel value for that coordinate. Okay, so we take the coordinate x, y, and then we produce a value. And how we produce this value? Well, let's look at this example over here. Rather than parsing the formula, let's look at this example here. So if we have this um, x, y point, what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at, at the corner of the box here, right? This, this box where everything is an integer coordinate. And we're going to look at these this, this, uh, corners and looking at the uh, opposing um, opposing uh, boxes and uh, determining how much each box contributes. So what this thing here does, this equation is essentially weighs the contribution of uh, each of these boxes. So for instance, if you take um, this first line here, where you have P, 
x1, y1. So p x1, y1 is the value, value of the pixel uh, at the coordinate x1, y1, x1, x1, y1. So over here, so it has some value, so p x1, y1. And then what we have here, we have x2 minus x, so x2 over here and x over here. So this gives us the length over here of this green um, rectangle. And y2 minus y, okay, this is going to be the height of the rectangle over here. And so this is just going to give us the, uh, the area over here of this rectangle. So I'm gonna multiply this px1, y1 times the uh, area of the rectangle. And we do this for each of the corners, right? And then we combine them and then we get our, um, the value of our uh, coordinate here, x nonlinear coordinate x, y. And this is you know, visually, visually expressed in this way. So each of these hyper rectangles contribute so each of these boxes here contributes to the um, to the value of the pixel at coordinate x y. Okay. Okay. Good. So this is interpolation and uh, bilinear interpolation. This is, as you can see, this is nonlinear here, right? It is nonlinear of in x y, right? I'm multiplying x y against the by over here. Uh, okay. So it's a nonlinear nonlinear function. So this already tells you that. Um, no, if you're trying to approximate this uh, function uh, a little bit, uh, may not be so uh, may not be so 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 direct with uh, convex relaxations. Okay, so we have our transformations like rotations, uh, translation, and so on, captured by this bijective function uh, t of kappa, right? Applied to the coordinate, and we have a way how to um, compute pixel values at uh, non-integer um, coordinates. So now we have to see how to combine these two uh, steps in order to compute the value of a pixel, all right? Um, and that combination is going to be something that we are going to be working with, okay? So let's see what happens here. Um, so what we have is uh, the following problem. We need to compute the pixel value at a given coordinate, so the coordinate x, y here, um, after a transformation p kappa, right? So maybe we rotate it by 30 degrees and we want to compute the pixel values uh, in the new image, okay? So what we do is this two-step process. So in the first step, what we do, remember this is a bijective function, this p kappa. And so what, what we do, is we take the coordinate x, y in the new image, right? Of which, whose values of the pixel we want to determine. So we want to determine the value of the pixel at this, at this point. And uh, we compute the pre-image, okay? Of this uh, function, t kappa. So t kappa inverse, basically. Once we do that, the problem is that we may end up in um, non-integer coordinates, right? And so then we need to interpolate. And so that's what that's what uh, will end up happening here. Okay. Um, okay. Let me just uh, move on. So what is going on here now is we are going to be defining this function i kappa. Okay. So this function i kappa over here we're going to be defining this. And this function i kappa is essentially going to take a coordinate and is going to determine the value of the pixel at that coordinate, at the value here. And the way that it does is exactly what it says uh, in the two steps above. The first is going to compute the pre-image, right, by, by um, the pre-image of this coordinate x, y. We're going to end up in another coordinate where x, y no longer need not be uh, integers, okay? And then we're going to apply the function i, this interpolation, in order to compute the pixel values, pixel value at that new non um, integer coordinate. And this is going to be the value, the pixel value that we assign in our new image uh, to the coordinate x, y, okay? So um, this function i kappa, we're going to see a lot of it writing what follows, so it's good to remember it, right? So maybe write it down on the side, 
or just just take a look look at it a little bit more just to make sure that you that you're familiar with it we'll see it later in the later uh, parts of the lecture but this is something that we we should uh, we should remember okay all right so let's see um, an example here so this is our uh, let me pick another color just because we have right on the slides already so here we have our original image free and so some mnist digit free and we have we here we have some image that's rotated by some angle pi over four and uh, our goal is what we want to do is to compute the pixel value at this um, red um, point over here and so let's assume that the coordinate here of this red point is five one okay and uh, we're just making up some coordinate here just to illustrate the process so what we're going to do, we're going to apply um, the inverse of the transformation, all right? So we're going to apply inverse of the rotation here to this coordinate, so x, y, x is five, y is one. And then once we do that, we're going to end up with some uh, coordinates that are clearly uh, not integers, okay? And once we do that, our goal will be to find the pixel values that, you know, at that coordinate, okay? And so, as we said before, we're going to perform the interpolation at that coordinate over here. And uh, this is going to result in some pixel value that you know, we're making up these values here, just for the example. So this pixel value here, this pixel is going to have this value, let's say 0 0.3, all right? And so you do that for all of the pixels, and you're going to end up with um, the pixel values for each of these pixels in this rotated image, all right? So this is how um, the process of computing the pixel values in the new image uh, will work. And we have to know this process because we are going to be um, you know, applying certification to this, uh, to this, uh, to these functions. All right. So um, let's move on. Hopefully, this is clear. So as I said, this knowing these uh, steps, what the interpolation is, what the geometric transformations are, how they're combined, is important because we're going to be focusing now on certification. We're going to see in a second what we mean by certification. Okay. But this is what I mean. So far, it's just the um, just the prerequisites in a sense to what we'll be doing. And now we need to focus on how we actually certify this uh, robustness to these geometric transformations, okay? So there hasn't been much work in the space uh, of certifying um, deep neural networks to geometric transformations. In fact, uh, this work that we did uh, last year was the first work which was uh, certifying geometric transformations to um, compositions of various um, transformations like um, rotations, translations, interpolation, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the first to consider uh, classic by cubic, by linear, and so on interpolations, right? So we're going to be studying the techniques from this paper. Uh, they are also quite illustrative and educational when it comes to uh, applying uh, a lot of the material that we've been uh, studying so far and seeing where we need to change things and where we need, we can just reuse it from, from scratch. Okay, so let's uh, move on. All right, so what we have here um, is we have the following situation. We have, let me just use another, um, let me just use another color here. So we're given an image O, so just to understand what we mean by certifying geometric robustness, we are given an image O, and that is the image over here. Okay, that's the original image, image three. Okay, this is the MNIST data set. And now what we want to do is to certify that no matter how we rotate this image, right, by whatever angle we rotate this image in the range minus 30 to 30, right, and, um, Right. So however, how, however we rotate it, we want to make sure that the neural network classifies each of these rotated points in that range um, of the original image as uh, free. Okay. 
And so this gray area here represents all of the possible, um, all of the possible uh, images that you could uh, obtain in this in this way. All right. So it's a very very large set of images uh, that you can uh, that you can get here. All right. Um, so you cannot just enumerate these points. You cannot just enumerate each of these images here and check each one in isolation, right? Um, okay. So uh, what are we going to do now? How are we going to do this problem if we cannot just enumerate? Well, we know how to do it generally speaking. We need some form of abstraction. We need a way to represent all of these possible images here, right? And so, um, this shape here, the gray shape, this may be a highly non-convex shape. Um, so if we just exactly represent it, it actually may be difficult to verify much because uh, the neural network verification methods would uh, not be uh, maybe not so effective and uh, would not really scale to uh, realistic networks. Okay. Um, so let's just, uh, so what are we trying to do here? This is important to understand. What we're trying to do is to find an over approximation of that gray shape, such that when you feed it to the neural network, when you feed it to the neural network, this is the neural network here, we can prove that everything inside that gray shape, gray shape classifies to free. Okay, everything classifies to free. Now, there are two steps here, as you can see. One will be, step one will be representing that gray shape or approximation of that gray shape that we'll see in a second. And the second step will be, as before, as everything we have studied before, we're going to take that gray shape and we are going to push it through the neural network with standard verification methods. So just like before. And so what you see here is an example of, it's not just where we take the image free and we put an L infinity bow around the image free. We actually have a process, if you like a generative process, which uh, produces potentially an uncountable or very large set of, of points like that, the rotated images in this case, we want to over, over approximate this set, generate a specification that we can then push through the neural network with standard means and verify our property. So the specification is in a sense induced by, uh, by the rotation of the uh, rotation range of the original image. Okay, so that's a good example of Situation where specifications are not just uh, this L infinity balls that, that we are we looked at so far. Yet we can reuse all of the verification machinery for the second part over here. All right. So let's see what we have. Well, because typically we cannot represent this gray shape exactly. And even if we could, propagating it in that way for the network may be extremely expensive and not scale. What we need to do is figure out a way in which we can approximate this. Uh, we can approximate the shape uh, via some some uh, some some more tractable shape. So here we have approximated with this blue polyhedra shape. Okay, somehow we have done this. And then what we'll do is we'll push that blue blue polyhedra shape. Of course, that blue polyhedra shape. Like we're going to push it for the network with standard verification mean. Now, of course, this blue polyhedra shape may have points here which could never happen, right? They're not feasible. But nonetheless, if we're able to verify the blue polyhedra shape that everything classifies to free, then uh, it doesn't matter. We succeeded in proving also the gray shape, all right? So that's how it's going to work. And so what we're going to be concerned in this lecture is computing this uh, blue part over here, right? That's what we want to do. And not going to worry about pushing that blue part for the network, which is something we looked at already in the previous lectures. All right. Okay, so the question will be, how do we represent this convex region, C R phi O, this thing over here, how do we represent it? What shapes are we using to represent this region? Okay, so let's... Uh, Move on and uh, see that. Oops, let's just erase this thing so that they don't they don't uh, they don't bother us uh, here. All right. So what do we have here? What can we do? What are we going to do? So what we're going to do is we're going to represent this blue shape 
in the deep, deep poly convex relaxation shape. That's what we're going to do. So basically what that means is that for every pixel, we are going to have two constraints, two, two affine expressions, two linear expressions, one for the lower bound and one for the upper bound. So that's what we're going to do. That's our, our um, blue region is going to be in the relaxation of the poly, okay? But what's interesting here is we're going to be using the deep poly convex relaxation shape, right? But we're not going to use its transformers to compute that shape. So one baseline, of course, is to use the transformers. We'll see what that means in a second for the deep poly convex relaxation in order to produce the blue shape. But we're actually not going to do this. We are going to just use its shape, use the constraints that it provides, but we're going to compute those constraints in a different way, okay? And so that gives you another way to compute the constraints, which is uh, interesting and different from before. And one of the baselines we're going to compare with is going to be deep poly. We're going to construct deep poly abstract transformers for the operations of, the, let's say, the rotation and the interpolation, okay? So that we can compute that you know, blue, blue shape there and compare this method versus the other method that we're going to be discussing in the lecture. Okay, we're going to compare them also experimentally. And one thing that you will notice there is because if you take the step-by-step -step way of computing the transformers of uh, abstract effects of each of the statements in the rotations, each of the operations in the rotation, in the translation, and so on, because you're doing it step-by-step, -step, you are losing precision, right? That's one thing to keep in mind, versus what we'll do in the, in the lecture is going to be essentially one step over the whole uh, operations over the whole transformations. And that's why intuitively it's going to be more precise than uh, constructing transformers for each of the operations of these geometric transformations, right? As we had uh, done before when we, we constructed deep poly area relaxations, okay? But don't worry about this for now. The key high level point is that we're going to be using its convex relaxation shape, these two constraints, but not really using its abstract transformers. Okay, so one possible baseline, of course, is over here, is we don't even use the deep poly convex relaxation shape. We just take that uh, function, I kappa over here. So this is the function that we um, introduced. I remember I told you write it down. Uh, so this is the function that um, applies the interpolation to the inverse of the uh, transformation applied on XY, okay? And one thing we can obviously do is we can uh, because this kappa over here is typically a hyper rectangle, we can just push this kappa uh, through the function i and obtain um, back bo box bounds for the resulting pixel. So we're just going to obtain some lower and upper bound. Okay, via the standard box transformers, we've seen before, box abstract transformers. Then we can compute lower and upper bound for every pixel value, right? So this is fairly direct. So box is always a good, um, always a good baseline to have and to compare to because it is easy, and sometimes it even works well. Not in this case, but uh, it's a good good baseline to have, nonetheless. Okay, so this is one possible baseline, and we'll see that it is actually much less precise than the one that we're going to be discussing. But it is still sound, and you can uh, use it. It's fast and sound. Okay, so that's one baseline. Okay. Um, and the reason why this potentially doesn't work as well as the methods that we're going to be looking at is that, um, right, we have this transformation over here, this, uh, this function i kappa, right? And what happens is that um, the images that are getting pushed for this, uh, the, the points that, the values that we're getting for these pixels, right? So in general, um, there is a relationship between the pixels through this parameter kappa over here, right? So if we are computing for every pixel and the values of that pixel to be some expression of kappa, and we do this for every pixel, clearly they're going to be related for the kappa somehow. So it's good to capture those relationships. But if we're using boxes, then obviously we cannot capture this relationship. We're just going to end up with concrete lower and upper bounds, okay? Um, there is a typo here. 
bir yapmam yok şu iki yapma. Ve şimdi ki. Okay. And so this motivates uh, our technique that we're going to be studying here, uh, computing expressions for the pixel values that are a function of kappa, right? And together, when we combine these expressions for each of the pixels, we're going to end up end up with our blue region that we that we care about, and which we're going to then fit for the neural network. Okay. okay. So let's look at the method that we're going to be using, and things will get more uh, more concrete okay what are we trying to do more mathematically so what our goal is we want to compute sound we want to compute sound sound lower and upper bound constraints of this function over here i kappa x y okay where kappa reminder kappa is the um, parameters of the transformations like the rotation angle for instance right Okay, and so we are going to have a lower constraint. So this is an expression on the on the left side is the an expression that captures the lower bound, and on the right is an expression that captures the upper bound. These are exactly these two these two planes that we've seen before when we looked at deep poly. This is exactly the deep poly shape, right? Before we just had it for uh, every neuron. Before when we looked at deep poly, every neuron was bounded like this. But now we are looking at uh, every pixel uh, value is uh, bounded like this, okay? And so, uh, right, that's what that's what we want to do. And the key thing is sound, okay? So this has to be a really big bounds. And obviously, this has to hold, if it is sound, it has to hold for all possible values of these uh, kappas. Let's say if it's rotation for all possible angles uh, in the range, let's say minus 30 to 30 degrees, okay? So we're going to have such constraints, uh, such expressions, such bounds computed for every pixel, um, you know, after the rotation followed by interpolation, right? We're going to have this for every pixel. When you combine them, we're going to get that blue box uh, we had uh, before. Okay, so let's see what we do here. Um, what the key challenge is. Well, the problem here is that, um, we, you can compute some constraints here, but as we said, I mean, we can put concrete lower bounds and upper bounds here and as boxes, right? So we just put box, but this will not be very precise. Okay, so we essentially get rid of the W, L, T times kappa and just be left with B, L and B, U. Okay, things like this. So the goal is to have pretty precise tight bounds on this uh, function, I kappa, okay? And if you're talking about tight bounds here, we need to define how we actually measure tightness, okay? So we're gonna have two challenges, try to make them, you know, we want them sound, but we also want them to be as tight as uh, possible, okay? So, oops, let's uh, get this going, so it's not disturbed. So what we have here is, um, let's see, how we measure this tightness for the um, bounds that we are proposing. And so if you remember in the case of the deep poly, we had this kind of, oh, also we had this in the zonotope, we had these um, questions, what is the tightest approximation of the ReLU? And uh, when we discussed it at that point, we may have mentioned that uh, the approximation that we are picking is one of the minimum area in the two dimensional input output plane. So this is one heuristic that we used back then. Um, here, because we the, the kappa can uh, be more than more than, more than two dimensions, right? Um, we may need to generalize this to more than two dimensions and to um, reduce the area, reduce the volume that uh, of our approximation. So how do we do this? Um, let's see. So what we have is a way to measure volume between the relaxation. So let's look at here between the relaxation and the exact function. So let's measure the volume, the tightness for our lower bound constraints. So throughout the uh, lecture, we are mostly going to be focusing on the lower bound constraints. The upper bound constraints are identical, just so that we don't repeat the same thing twice, right? So let's focus on this thing here. And so what it says is that we have the integral, you integrate this function inside the integral, 
in this in the space where the kappa ranges over. So potentially, let's say all the angles between minus 30 and 30. And then what you want to do is you want to compute this uh, compute this compute this difference here between the true function, the exact function, and the approximated approximated function. Okay. And what your goal is, as we'll see, is to um, is to minimize this uh, volume, minimize this volume L, right? So for a given um, WL and BL that we find, we can compute the volume in this way, integrated over this kappa in this range, okay? And this is, uh, should be fairly standard, right? Not surprising, okay? So of course, if you change the WL and BL, you would need to uh, recompute again the the computer integral, okay? So uh, the problem here is with these integrals is that, um, right, that evaluating those integrals exactly in practice is actually uh, hard, it's difficult um, or infeasible. And so typically what happens is in practice, we approximate the integral by, uh, by, uh, by something. All right, and that's, what, that's what's going to happen here. So what we're going to be concerned with now is we're going to be concerned with we approximating this integral, all right? But of course, when we, uh, uh, you know, to uh, minimizing this expression, uh, and if we do that, we still need to worry about soundness. So let's see how we deal with a lot of these questions now. Um, so let's uh, move on. So what we have here is our goal, as I mentioned, we're going to have, I just wrote the two optimization problems just to be clear that it's not a single optimization problem because we one optimization problem for the uh, for the L, another optimization problem for the U, right? And so what we have is our goal is to find this WLBL, these parameters of our expressions, okay, and WBU, of course, which try to minimize the volume, try to minimize this expression over here, okay? Um, Right, so as we mentioned, uh, this is hard to compute these integrals, and so typically um, these are approximated. And not only that, what we want with our optimization problems is to realize that they're constrained, because whatever it, WLBA we find, we still want to make sure that this is sound, because if, if it's not sound, according to this, this is what soundness means here. Okay, then we really cannot prove anything. Um, Okay, and this is actually quite tricky because uh, this could be, as it says, a uh, very large uncountable set of values over here, kappa, uh, possibly rotation angles, let's say. Okay, so let's see how we uh, approximate the solution to this uh, optimization problem while still worrying about sound. So really our difficulties are going to arise or um, kind of the more technical bits are going to arise when we need to worry about soundness. So let's see how we worry about soundness and what we do about this. Because the moment you're talking about approximating integrals, right? Um, so, okay, I'm going to get it as tight as possible, maybe very tight, maybe optimally tight, but I still need to worry about the soundness business. Okay, so let's look at the two steps here, uh, what we have. So what we have is these two steps in order to produce our uh, approximate uh, optimization problem. So in the first step, we're going to replace the integral by summation, which is standard uh, via uh, sampling, via Monte Carlo approximation. So essentially we take n samples, n samples <clears throat> for the possible values of kappa. And uh, each of these samples is going to trigger one value, one possible value of kappa. So we may have kappa one, kappa two, kappa, kappa n values that we sampled, let's say different rotation angles, right? So we're going to do that. And for each of these, we are going to compute the uh, difference, right? We're going to compute that function over here and sum up the functions, sum up this, some of these uh, expressions and then divide by the number of samples. Okay, so that's the first step. Okay, um, so we get the following expression. All right, um, and then we need to uh, worry about uh, soundness, right? Again, I'm showing it here only for the lower bound. The situation with the upper bound is the same, it's identical. Um, 
So we need to worry about this uh, soundness business. So let's try to incorporate a little bit of soundness into the optimization problem. So let's not deal with this potentially large set of constraints. Let's make it smaller, finite set of constraints. And so for each of these samples, we can also generate the uh, corresponding constraints for the, uh, for the true values of the function over here, okay? So this kappa over here, kappa over here, and kappa i are the same. This is the values of the angle, let's say, in rotations. Okay, so now we have these two parts of the optimization problem. So we have a little bit of soundness over here. Not the full soundness because we are not ranging over all the possible uncountable set of values that kappa can take, like let's say the rotation angle, but we have finitized it a little bit. And of course, we approximated the uh, integral over here by, by the sampling and summation. Okay, we can take these two pieces over here, this and that, uh, and fit them to a um, linear programming solver, like Gorobi or some other solver, and obtain approximate solution, something that tries to minimize this uh, WLBL while keeping the constraints over here. So we're going to end up with some values, some approximate values of the true WLBL with some WL hat and BL hat that approximate the true values of the um, of the um, you know of the of, of the of what we want. Okay. Okay. So that's good. But the problem is that uh, how do we know that the resulting uh, constraints, the resulting uh, values that we get for WL hat and BL, BL hat are actually sound? That's something that we need to worry about now. Okay, so let's move on and see what we do here. So before we, we, before we actually discuss the soundness business a little bit more, let's see, let's illustrate the issue a little bit over here. So what we have is we have, um, we remember we sampled a bunch of random points. So let's look at rotations here. Okay, so we're talking about angles. So our I kappa is going to be interpolation combined with uh, rotation because just for our example here. Okay, so this is our running example with the coordinate five one. And we are rotating, we are considering rotations in this angle between zero and pi over four, okay? So what we have here, let's let's look at this diagram a little bit. Well, first of all, these lines over here, these horizontal lines, these dashed lines, this is the um, this is the um, interval approximation, like the crude, the rough interval approximation of the pixel values that you would get at this coordinate five one. That's what happens, right? We just ran the intervals. We ran the intervals, so we ran intervals with this box over here, zero pi over four, through the entire uh, interpolation composed with the inverse, okay? And this would give you slower and upper bound, lower and upper bound, lower bound here, upper bound here, and that's how we got those dashed lines, okay? So that's good. But as you can see, it's actually quite imprecise. So the true function here is this function in blue, which, which we don't compute for just, for the, just for, the, um, for the illustration. Now, what we have, what, we, what our method says is, well, let's um, try to get tighter, bound, tighter bounds for a pixel value by sampling. So let's sample some angles. So let's sample some angles here. And uh, you know, we sample angles here, here, some angles. And of course, when you, when you run it through the function, you're going to get the pixel values. And with angle and the pixel value, we can just get those points here. This, this, this circle points here. So we have five samples over here. Okay, so if we have these five samples over here, then uh, from the previous slide, we know that we can invoke the linear programming solver and try to find some approximation of the parameters of those expressions for the lower bound. Okay, and so we find this BL, we find some values, let's say BL is 1.07 and WL, WL hat is minus 0 0.9, so BL hat and WL hat. Okay, um, so we have that. And um, what this is, this defines a line, right? This defines a line, and this is going to be this line. Let me pick another color so that we can see better. Let's say we pick this green color. So it's going to define this line over here. Okay, so it's gonna define this line over here. 
I'm not drawing it super great, but it's like this line over here, uh, these parameters that we just picked, okay. But remember that we instantiated our optimization problem with just particular angles, and we encoded those sound as constraints, but they're just constraints for those particular angles, not for all the angles, not for the entire range over here, from zero to pi over four. And so now we have a situation, I mean, we may get lucky, but here we didn't. Uh, and what we have is we have this part over here that I'm circling now of the true function, which actually is not lower bounded by anything, right? So this is the pixel value here, and that pixel value is not lower bounded by any, any line, right? Uh, any, any line, this green line, the parameters that we learn are unfortunately not sound. They only sound for the points, but not for, for the points we sampled, but not for all of the points that we need, okay? Um, obviously, we have the upper bound here, which we didn't talk about, but it's computed in an analogous way, okay? So we have the upper bound here. Okay, uh, so the question remains then, how are we going to be dealing with this part over here, this way of sampling points and computing um, you know, values for the lower bound, conversely, well, similarly for the upper bound, but here we're dealing with the lower bound, may inherently not reach sound, uh, sound results, okay? And so uh, we need to do something about it to deal with this, to deal with these points. And if you look at the picture here, one thing we're going to be deal doing it intuitively, we're going to be essentially trying to shift this line downwards. So we're gonna take this green line and uh, we are going to be trying to shift it downwards so that we can get some line like this over here. It's a good line over here that is actually sound. And how are we going to be doing that? We need to somehow find this distance over here, okay? And that's what we are going to be worried about with our method. We're going to try to find that distance, essentially the violation distance, and if we can just find that distance or an over approximation of that distance, we'll just shift, it, shift this green line lower by essentially just changing BL hat, okay? And then we are going to be good as far as soundness goes. But we need to see how we're actually going to be shifting it, how we're going to be finding by how much we should shift this BL hat in order to be sound, okay? So um, let's see this, um, okay. Um, okay, so let's see where we are. Okay, let me just use the uh, colors. So uh, this is our situation here. We are sound for a finite set of samples, finite, finite set of points here. We want to get sound for all of the points, okay? And so let's see how to do this. Um, so what we need to do, as I said, we need to be sound for all of the points, kappa, not just for some of the points, okay? Uh, and how are we going to do this? So this is the key idea of the shifting business that I explained on the previous slide. And again, we're going to be focusing on the lower bound because the lower bound is, uh, the upper bound is similar. Okay, so what we're going to do, and that's the key idea of the shifting business, we are going to compute an upper bound delta on, on the maximum violation over the entire parameter space, like the entire um, rotation range, let's say minus 30 to 30 or like zero to pi over four that we had on the previous slide. Okay. So what we have here, let's look at the, let's look at the, let's look at the um, situation with the lower bound. What we have here is we have over here, over here we have the, um, let's see over here, this is the um, approximated uh, expression because this is the values that we got from our linear solver. This is the true function over here. And so what we want to do is we want to bound this difference by finding some delta L over here. So we need to study this a little bit to get an intuition, and you can do this yourself. So one way to study to see what's going on is to think of the following thing. 
let's suppose that um, <clears throat> this expression over here, right, this that I've circled, is actually unsound, like we had in the previous slide. Well, if it is actually unsound, then what's going to happen is there's going to be some kappa, okay? We, there's some angle, just like we saw in the previous slide, where if we plug it in here, okay, if we plug it in here, this value here inside this expression produced by this expression with this b and w coefficients is going to be it's going to be it's going to let me circle this other one too here now this is going to be if it is unsound this is going to be greater than than the one on the right because it is unsound it's supposed to be a lower bound but now it is greater okay so you're going to when you subtract these two expression this one and this one then you're going to get some uh, positive value, okay? And you're trying to find some delta L that bounds this value. It's ideally, some small delta L, some tight delta L that bounds this value. Okay, so if you're unsound, you're going to get this positive value and then you're, you're trying to find the smallest one. So there may be many such, for different kappas, there may be many such angles, let's say that you can plug in here, where this is greater than the true, the true value here. And you're trying to find the uh, one that um, bounds all of them, ideally the maximum of those, okay? But you may not be able to compute it exactly. And so you want to find something that, um, want to find something that bounds this uh, violation distance. So when you subtract this one on the left with this one on the right here, now when you subtract these two, you're going to get some value, that's your violation distance, and you're trying to bound this violation distance, okay? All right, so that's the intuition, and you can do the um, you can play with it in, in in the other direction too. When this is actually sound, when this is actually sound, this means that for all of the case, all of the kappas that you pick, uh, this thing on this this here is going to be less than or equal to this uh, true value here, and so um, when you subtract them, this is going to be zero or a negative number. Okay. Uh, and so then uh, essentially um, you are again trying to find the uh, tightest bound delta L. But the best is to, to imagine it that this is the uh, greater because this is a violation and then you're trying to find the tightest, tightest delta L, tightest violation, um, okay? So that's what's happening. Similar, similar situation is for the, uh, for the upper bound. So, if you can find this delta L, this magical delta L, and hopefully it's not too large because we can make it very large and trivially bound everything, but then you're going to get very approximate uh, bounding going on. Well, if you're able to find find it, then well, then you know trivially this is you know this is the largest this is the largest bound here delta L. You can just uh, shift the you can compute the new BL value from this approximated BL by subtracting this bound over here, okay? And uh, you can see why would this make the resulting constraint sound because delta L is the largest value. So if I decrease this BL hat by delta L, if I decrease it by delta L, then what's gonna happen? Then the resulting uh, expression over here is going to be less than or equal to zero if you subtract this and this one over here because it's became it became uh, became smaller, okay? Just smaller by this largest possible bound over here, right? If you just plug in the largest possible bound over here, so by just doing um, those kind of things, um, you can just if you can compute this delta, L, you can just shift the BL that you got from the linear programming by just a little bit downwards, hopefully not too much, and you know keep the Ws the same. And then, then you would be, then you would be good. Then you would get a sound result, okay. And similarly for the upper bound, upper bound you need to increase here. Soundness is in the other way. The upper bound may be too low, right? So maybe too low. So you need to increase it in order for it to become sound. And then you solve a similar, uh, you know, you have to find a similar delta u as you do in the delta delta l case. So now the question is, how do you actually find this delta l? Okay, so let's see how we actually find delta L. We're gonna see a couple of ways. And uh, so let's study this these ways. Um, okay, and then see how they how they differ. Okay. Um, 
So just to understand here, our goal is uh, to compute this delta L, so to find the essentially an upper bound of this function. Okay, so this is the subtraction that we had on the previous slide. Everything is the same, and this is over the domain D. And this domain can be um, typically it's some form of a hyperrectangle, like in the in the case of the uh, in the case of the rotation, is just uh, it's just a box which captures the uh, angle ranges. Okay, so one simple way and uh, and a good way that you can actually do that is to um, apply standard um, convex relaxations. And you can just, for example, take the box abstraction, take the box relaxation, and um, what you can do is you can, because this D here, as I said, is typically a hyper rectangle, okay? And so you can essentially in propagate this whole hyper rectangle D through the uh, function f of k. And if I propagate this through the function f of k, this hyper rectangle, I'm going to end up with, with the box propagation, okay, with the box relaxation. Then I'm going to end up with some lower and upper bounds for this uh, function f. And I can just take the upper bound because that's what I care about. I want to find the greatest value possible that this function can take. And this is going to be my, uh, this is going to become my, uh, well, I'm not drawing it very nicely, but this is going to become my delta L, okay? By taking this, this uh, upper bound over here. May not be super tight, but it is sound, okay? Of course, you can also try other uh, propagations, like other relaxations here. So see how these convex relaxations are coming into play, not just when you're analyzing the neural network, but they're coming into play when you're analyzing uh, functions um, trying to bound them, whose result is going to be processed by neural network verifiers. So they come in handy in this way as well. Uh, so you can use boxes, you can use zonotops, you can use other convex relaxations to push this hyper um, hyper rectangle uh, through the uh, function uh, function f here. Okay. So this is one way in which, which you can do it. That's interesting, and uh, you, know, you can try that and see see what the results you get. Okay, another way in which you can uh, solve that problem is by uh, uh, computing the upper bound in a different way. So let me just explain that here. What you can do here is to realize that uh, you know this function f of k f of kappa can uh, also be written in this form due to the mean value theorem, right? Um, so you can apply the mean value theorem here. And uh, if you apply the mean value theorem, what the mean value theorem tells you is that f of kappa is going to be f of kc. So kc here is just the center of the hyper rectangle D, okay? So imagine D is a hyper rectangle. Okay, D is a hyper rectangle over here. And so KC is just the center. We just picked some point. It could be some other point. It doesn't have to be the center point, but we just pick the KC, okay, here. And so what it tells you is that F of kappa can be written as um, F of KC, some point in the range where kappa ranges, okay, plus the um, gradient of that uh, function, F, okay, uh, evaluated at some um, kappa prime, some values inside this um, D, inside this hyper rectangle, where the kappa prime ranges is between K, uh, kappa and Kc. Okay? So this is you know, multiply times, multiply times kappa minus Kc. And so this thing here is just a direct application of the uh, of the of the mean value theorem. Okay. So uh, now this is the transpose here of the resulting vector that you get when you apply the gradient of that function, and we have to see what the gradient is, the gradient of that function to this k prime, to this point k prime. So there exists such a point k prime where you can actually write it in this way. Okay. All right. Um, 
So now what happens is that we need to see what's going on here. So this gradient of the function, so what are you taking the gradient? This is gradient with respect to the, so the gradient is form of the partial derivative. So it's going to be the partial derivative with respect to the first dimension, partial derivative with respect to the second dimension of these parameters kappa. So if you have, for instance, a translation, which has um, two parameters, uh, shift to the shift in the x direction, shift in the y direction, then you'd have partial derivative with respect to the first dimension, first, first dimension and partial derivative with respect to the second dimension. They would form your gradient here of that function, okay? Okay, um, now one thing you can do here um, is if you have this function f of, uh, f of kappa, right? Over here you have the function f of kappa and we have written it in this way, you can actually, so this is a quality here, Okay, so this is a quality here. All right, so we can, we can compute the gradients, um, right? We can write like this, but you can actually bound that function. You can bound this function like that. And what it says is, is if you can bound the gradient over here, if you can bound the gradient of the function, which means that if you can bound the, essentially every entry of the gradient, so every partial derivative of that function, partial derivative with respect to the first dimension, second dimension, and so on. If each of these dimensions is bounded by some, um, some value here, uh, L of i, then we can just uh, write, this, write this in the following way, right? It becomes less than or equal to, of course, because of this, this, this thing over here, okay? Uh, then we can just get rid of all this k prime business. So the important bit though is that this constants that we are computing over here, okay, notice that this is not the Lipschitz constant. This is constant computed for every dimension of this um, parameter uh, of kappa, okay? So we have L of one, L of two, if it has two, uh, two dimensions. And so, um, this has to be sound. It really has to be a bound that for any k prime, if we're applying this partial derivative, any k prime, right, to any k prime in the range, it is less than this bound L of i. So if you can have that, then you can rewrite that, that on the left with this function on the right, but you have inequality here now, okay, because of this inequality. Okay, and so now we have a function of k of c, some center point of the, uh, so where is this? The center point of this range here, of this hyperrectangle, okay? Could be some other point, but let's just pick the, the center point, plus uh, this vector over here, okay? Which is the bound that's computed, right? So this is bounded, and then we transpose it just like here, we have the transpose here, we have the same, times k minus kc, okay? Now, uh, if you look at this expression over here, if you look at this expression over here, this is still um, this is still not not a constant. And so, what you want to do is to uh, just just compute the compute the constant value here. Okay, um, so it's not a constant because you still have this f of k over here appearing. This k is appearing here. Okay, so we just want to bound the whole thing at the end. So how do we do that? So let's be very careful here. There are two steps uh, which you can actually write by yourself. Um, this, is, this is pretty direct. But if this D, which is the hyperrectangle, okay, uh, and so this is the, we have the uh, two vectors, HL and HU, okay, that form your hyperrectangle, then, um, we can define the center point as follows, right? H -A -H -U plus H L divided by two, okay? So that's one, that's KC, so this is KC. Okay, so that's fine. But the K, the K is still there, this K here that we wanna get rid of. So we somehow need to bound the K. Okay, uh, if we want to bound the K, well, what does the K range over? Like what is the highest possible value of k. Well, the highest possible value of k is going to be hu, okay? And so this expression over here, this expression k minus kc, 
if you actually plug in the uh, expression HU for K minus the expression for KC, which we have over here, this one over here, okay, if you do that calculation, you are going to end up with the following expression, HU minus HO times one half. So that's where the one half times HU minus HO comes from. Just plug in uh, for eight for K, you can just plug in the HU. Okay, so just plug in the HU. Okay, minus for the KC, you can just plug in the uh, one half. So HU plus HO divided by two. Okay, and then you are going to end up with one half, uh, one half times uh, HU minus uh, minus HO, and that's exactly what happens. And so here we have uh, another inequality over here. Of course, we are bounding even further, but still, I mean, still inequality, and we end up with the following uh, value here. So if and this this is this is a uh, this is a constant uh, this is a constant uh, constant value here. So that's going to be this whole thing here that we get ultimately in green. And this whole thing here is going to be our u. Well, that's upper bound. That's essentially the delta L that we. I'm, I'm writing it in a very ugly way, but delta L over here. Okay. So uh, let me just. Okay, this is delta L. Try to write it in a better way. Um, delta L. Okay. So we have that, okay? So that's what this delta L is. All right, so this is uh, quite nice. And um, um, you can see that here we don't have the K. And so when you, so how does it work? When you are given a, let's recap this. When you are given this D range, this big D range, and this is a hyper rectangle, which is described in the following way, you want to compute, the um, you know the upper bound of that function f of k on this range h l h u okay that's our goal that's going to be some constant value that we want to compute and the way we do that is I mean the first step is just the mathematical justification the first story writes but the last one over here over here really is the formula the only thing we need to do is just to plug in the values of h l and h u okay and to compute these constants here, Li. So that's actually very important. Let me use another color here. How would we um, compute? Because we need a few things. We need HO, HU. This is all good. So this is check mark. If we're given the D, we know what HU is. We know what HO is. Everything is good. Everything is easy here. But we need this thing over here. So every time that the D changes, like I give you a new D, new HO, new HU, Okay, I can just plug them in, but I need to worry about this L over here. And this L is computed by bounding these partial derivatives of the function F uh, on this, you know, and where, where the K, when you apply it, is over this range. So how am I computing the bound over here? How am I computing these Li's? Well, again, the same thing as before. One way, given the gradient over here, of this function f, the partial, the partial derivative here, actually here, once I'm given a partial derivative, I can just propagate the d, I can just propagate via the box transformer, via the box relaxation, I can just propagate this d through the gradient, through the partial derivative, sorry, partial derivative with respect to i, okay, and obtain a lower and upper bound, and I can just use the upper bound here, okay? So to recap, to compute the upper bound here, we can just take this hyper rectangle here, D, and we can just run the D uh, through the gray partial derivative of the function F, okay, with the box relaxation, which is going to give us a lower and upper bound of this gradient, and we can just take the upper bound, and this is our uh, upper bound here that we get. So in summary, every time I give you a new um, range here, new hyper rectangle, right? Some parameter space, let's say the rotation angle, maybe the translation, translation uh, ranges and so on. I can directly plug them in here, one. And two, I can just compute, use the box relaxation to just push this range through the 
partial derivatives in order to compute the individual L of i's. So if I have just the angle, I'll just have a single, single um, one dimension. So I can just I can just push it through there. Um, just push it through this. Um, I'll just have L1. If I have translation, I'll have L1 and L2. Okay. And so this is the uh, way in which this method computes the bound. So to recap, it would be basically um, using the linear programming solver to get this, this uh, values over here, WLT and BL hat, WLT hat. Then you want to compute the delta L for this, to bound this function. One way, if you can, you can just do a convex relaxation, push it for this function, and then you go end up with some bound here. And then use that bound to just shift the BL lower, like in the picture slide. Another way you can do it is to um, plug in the range that you care about HL and HU in this equation over here that we're looking at, and um, push this range with a box relaxation or some other relaxation if you want to get more fancy to get the L LIs here. And then once we have the LIs, we have the L, we have this HO, HL, we can just evaluate this expression over here. Okay, so two different methods uh, in which we can compute the delta L bound that bounds this maximum violation. Okay. Okay, I hope that this is clear. You can play around with it a little bit and, uh, and uh, see if you can uh, um, right, get, a, get a good understanding here. So in practice, um, this range can be quite large. So if we're pushing box relaxations through either in option one or option two, you may get a lot of over approximation errors. So one way to do this, as we saw before, we can do a little bit of splitting on this range, on this hyper rectangle range D. We can split the D. This is our D. Let's go gray thing here. Let's see, it's our D. And so we can just split it into multiple rectangles here, four, and we can, so this is the case, this is the point. Okay. Um, of course, if you just do option one, you don't care about these cases. You can just uh, just uh, run the convex box relaxation or some other relaxation to compute an upper bound. So you can compute an upper bound here. You can compute an upper bound here. You can compute an upper bound here. You can compute an upper bound here with whatever option you want, option one or option two. You can even, even mix the options for one up, up, hyper rectangle. You can use one option for another hyper rectangle, you can use the second option or the first option, however you want. And once you get your bounds, you can just take the maximum one and this would be your uh, delta L, okay? So you can do this iterative splitting and uh, use heuristic to split it a bit to get more precise more precise bounds. This is not a fundamental point, but it, 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 it does improve the results in practice. Um, okay, good. So let's get back now to our example of rotations just to recap here what's going on and to see what the effect of all this uh, gymnastics is on our results, which is really what we care about here. So in the first space, when we apply the linear, pro linear programming solver, okay, we computed the orange region, right? This is the orange region, which was unsound. And the reason why it was unsound is because the blue function or the true function, this I kappa, was going out of range. So it was not a true lower bound here. Uh, neither it was a true upper bound, by the way, okay? So these things that these values, that these parameters that the linear programming solver discovered are not good enough, they're not sound. We need to get sound. And one way to get sound is to compute this delta L upper bound on the uh, violation, which we discussed in the previous slide. So we need to compute this. And so how are we going to compute this? Well, we are just going to, uh, apply what we did before. So this would be the expression. This is the, this is the WL. This is the BL hat, WL hat. And this is the kappa here, right? So this is this expression uh, with the BL and the kappa and the WL. And this is the, um, this is the, um, this whole thing here is the I kappa, which is the I phi in this case. Okay, so this is the I kappa that we have. This is just the expression from the previous slide with these coefficients. Okay, apply to the x, y, which is five and one. And so if we do that, um, right, use option one or option two, here we've used option two, we're just going to end up with some delta L of 0 0.1. Okay, I'll just end up with some number 0 0.1.
This is the bound on the maximal violation, the soundness violation, okay? And so then what we do, as we discussed already, we can shift the line lower. We can shift the line lower by minus 0.1. You can see that the reflex shifted by minus 0.1 here. Okay, so this line over here went down here to minus 0.1. The BO got shifted, and now this line is, uh, now it is sound. Okay, so it became sound by just shifting the line. Of course, like you see some gap over here. Uh, maybe we could have shifted a little, a little bit less if we had an even more precise uh, option three. Maybe that was combining doing a better branch and bound on the space, or it was using a more precise relaxation rather than box there to compute the L of I's, the bounds on the gradients, and so on and so forth. But here we got some, uh, we still got what we want, which is fairly tight here, okay? So that's nice. Uh, similar thing we did for the uh, upper line, we get the uh, delta U, okay? And we shifted that line a little bit going up. Okay, so this went up and this went down. Okay, and so when we do that, we end up with this uh, green region over here. This is this green region. I'm actually calling it red now, but this green region here is sound uh, approximation of the blue line of this I of K, all right? Okay, so in summary, we sample around, we get some points, BL hat, WL hat. Once we get those points, that's great, but if we're lucky, it's sound, but if we're not lucky, it is not sound, and if it's not sound, we need to compensate for this unsoundness by adding these margins uh, to, the, to the lines, which we compute typically by propagating convex relaxations, either on the I kappa, uh, on the I kappa uh, and, and the difference uh, on the Ws and Bs that we showed in option one, or in option two, we, um, we uh, propagate convex relaxations through the uh, partial derivatives, okay? So that's a good example of using convex relaxation without actually having talked at all about neural network certification. And now, if we have this green region here, right? We have the green region. I should probably switch to, to green, but if we have this green region over here, right? This big green region, then we can take that region. We have such regions for every pixel, and they're going to be in this deep poly shape with lower and upper bounds, right? Lower bound, upper bound. Um, and then we can just fit that region, fit the region through the neural network certifier. And you can use whatever certifier you want. You can use the deep poly certification, you can use um, MILP, and you can use whatever other certifier comes up. So this is quite orthogonal to the particular certifier that you are actually using, okay? All right, so I hope this was a, uh, give you some understanding of how this, uh, what happens here. So, we did, at that time, we did a bit of evaluation on this method, and quite a bit, actually. And uh, so this is an example with translation now here. Um, and uh, what we see is that, let's look at the, remind ourselves of the different baseline. That's what's important for us educationally here. Remember, right from the beginning, we talked about the interval relaxation. This is literally taking the I kappa, right? I kappa, this is the I kappa. So in the translation, it's whatever parameters these kappas are translation amounts for each in two directions. So we take this I kappa and we push through the I kappa the, um, right, so this I kappa is the interpolation combined with the translation in this case. We just push for, uh, for the I kappa um, this uh, translation parameters with the box relaxation. So this is very crude and this is what it gives you. This gives you these lines over here. This gives you these lines over here very crude approximation of the pixels, of the particular pixel value, okay? Another thing you can do, which we did, and that's interesting, we uh, designed custom deep poly transformers uh, which can uh, process this I kappa, okay? Uh, and uh, we, can, um, we can do that, we can process this I kappa, so not just with boxes now, but now with deep poly transformers, which are more precise, and capture some relationship between the pixels for these kappas, okay? And the challenge here, of course, is remember I told you interpolation is actually nonlinear, so you need to approximate that, so you need custom transformers for every operation that occurs in this I kappa, so in the translation, in the, in the uh, interpolation, okay? 
and so does it one at a time and you're going to get more precise results and this is the more precise result this is this region over here this bigger region it's still not super tight and the reason there is a fundamental reason for this is because because um the reason is that by doing operation by operation approximation of this i kappa so this is still i kappa here still i kappa by doing operation by operation whether it is box or whether it is deep poly transformers you lose precision right because the best transformer for a single operation so the combination of the best transformer for uh, a sequence of operations we take the best transformer for operation one follow the best transformer for operation two then the best transformer for operation three that we see in this i kappa maybe worse than the best transformer for the composed operation one operation two operation three which essentially is what we are trying to do here with our sampling and um, optimization and and whatever these options one and two i showed you okay and so um okay so that's the over here in red uh, actually the approximations produced by uh, this deep g as we called it uh, what the methods discussed in this lecture this is option two so option two produce this uh, produce these results and the fundamental reason why again is because essentially you're trying to treat the whole i kappa as one operation and produce the bounds instead of doing this step-by-step -step approximations at uh, each of the operations that occur in i kappa okay so the bottom line is this method turns out to be uh, quite a good match and um, this kind of method that i showed you actually tends to work well with uh, smaller dimensional inputs like here the kappa is few dimensions maybe a rotation angle one dimension maybe you have translation and so on and so forth it's a good match for this kind of techniques that i showed you here okay so this is our baselines so baseline one baseline two and the result of deep g all right so this is great um so now let's see our final goal at the end we have computed those results we have computed those blue regions we have computed those deep poly bounds on the um on the pixel values that can be produced by the particular transformations combined with interpolation but at the end we just want to verify that whatever the classification is still the correct one so let's see how this works in an end-to-end -end way so we have the rotation here let's say zero to five degrees and we have our operation i kappa kappa in this case is phi which is the rotation angle okay, this is our our normal operation just let me just just not cross over something here all right and then if you remember our networks from before it's not important the network just the binary classification property you want to make sure to prove that x1 the neuron x1 is always greater than the neuron x11 is always greater than the neuron x12 okay for any for any angle in the range zero to five degrees all right and so how do we do this well in the first way as we discussed you can use instead of using the deep poly bounds you can use this interval approximation so that's one way this baseline which is not so great so we can run the intervals for this i phi for this this thing over here we can run the box zero five through this i i zero five x y now and obtain some bounds so we're going to end up with some bounds here on the pixel x1 between five and six point five x2 between five and eight that's good and we're going to just now push it through for the neural network let's say we push it with deep poly if we push it with deep poly what we are going to end up happening is is what you can see on the slide deep poly is going to apply back substitution is going to end up with an expression like this over here and then when you substitute the interval bounds that we have x1 x1 equal to 6.5 x2 greater than 5 for here we are going to get the bound 0.3 so it's going to say that x11 minus x12 is getting get or equal to minus 0 0.3 which is not what we want we want to prove that it is greater than zero and so our verification uh, of this region produced with boxes box ran on the you know box on the pixel values that that is ran on this 
So we ran box twice. One on this uh, this pixel value here, x y. So this would be x one, and another one on uh, an, another an, another pixel coordinate x two. And it produced these two constraints. So that's not great. We we fail to prove it this way. Now let's see what would happen if we had let's get rid of these writings and let's see what happens if we had actually instead of the boxes use uh, use the um, deep poly constraints that we discussed uh, so far. So what we're going to end up happening is we are going to have let's say this lower and upper bound constraints for x1 and this lower and upper bound constraints for x2. And if we push this lower and up, and this, this can be obtained through um, option one or option two that we discussed, right? And then if you use the deep poly certification and you just do the back, back substitution and so on over here, you're going to end up essentially uh, be able to prove those bounds. So here is our, just like before, just like with intervals here, we, we do the substitution and now we plug in the bounds. For X2, we have 1.2. Phi. Okay, for x1, we have minus 1 plus 1 phi plus 1, and so on and so forth. And we plug it in, and we end up with 0 0.2, which is greater than 0. So using the deep poly constraints, the more precise constraints, and not just the more precise constraints, but the way in which this, so it's not enough to just use deep poly constraints. They are tighter than the intervals, but um, how we computed those deep poly constraints using the method I showed you. you now we obtain these constraints and then propagating those through the neural network resulted in a being, a being able to prove the property that we care about, okay? So we'll be able to prove here at the end that no matter how you rotate this input, no matter how you rotate an input, right? Well, in this case, we just have two pixels, just uh, simple. But no matter how we rotate it in the angle between zero and five, it is guaranteed that the network will be robust. It's always going to um, classify the result with a single single label. Okay, so this gives you a good idea also of the end-to-end -end process uh, of things. All right. So in summary, what we had, what happened in this lecture was we studied the problem of certifying neural networks, right, to geometric transformations like rotations, translations, combined with um, combined with interpolation, and this was, um, all right, this, uh, this uh, geometric transformations were expressed as a uh, bijective, uh, bijec bijective function, T of kappa, where the kappa captures the particular um, transformations that we're interested in, right? Um, so we studied that problem, and we showed several baselines. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, what it comes down to is finding bounds on the pixels that the transformation produces. And if you can find those bounds, you can then fit them to a standard neural network uh, verifier. And there's several ways to compute the bounds. One is just to propagate it through the function I of kappa, okay? Either the interval bounds or maybe the poly bounds, right? Um, but this is not, um, this is not as, as precise as uh, we could get. So we showed uh, a method where you compute tighter uh, deep poly, uh, you tend to compute tighter deep poly constraints, lower and upper bound for every pixel value in the transformed image. Um, you can take a look at the paper where we also, also discuss um, experiments with uh, combinations of transformations, for instance, translation with shearing, with rotation, combined with interpolation and so on and so forth. But the base method is exactly as I, as I uh, showed you here. It's exactly the method that is used. Okay, and so this lecture gives you a very good idea, I think, of uh, how would you produce the specifications that you fit to a neural network certifier. There is some pre-processing, some generative model, if you want going on before you actually fit the input, so you don't just take the input image and put uh, you know, boxes around the input image and then try to um, certify it. Um, you can generate potentially complex shapes from some other, pre-processing, like in this case, rotations. Similar situation happens with audio processing when you have to process the wave and produce a shape like, like this. Okay, so I hope this gives you a good idea. Um, 
of how to apply these techniques. Um, and uh, you enjoy the lecture and um, see you uh, next time.